Now it's, uh, I have the pleasure to announce myself. I told you it's, uh, they asked me to do all kinds of tricks today. I'm a jack of all trades. But uh, with me is my dear friend Nick. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about something that we have been working on in um, both of our communities. And it's trying to align the wishes of multiple orgs in an open source project. Yes, wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for making it. The last day, almost over. And so I'm Nick Vidal. I'm the community manager of the OSI, which is the Open Source Initiative. Who's here heard about the OSI, the Open Source Initiative? All right, you're in the right place. Good. <laughs> and so we coined the term open source over 25 years ago. And this has been instrumental to promoting uh, the permissionless innovation that we see everywhere, right? And we're still fighting the good fights and helping to promote open source. So thank you, everyone, for your support. We're involved in... Uh, I, myself, am involved in several projects uh, together with my colleagues. So uh, I'm the community manager for Clearly Define. Uh, I'm also working with open source AI. It's a hot topic right now. Uh, as you've seen from, from Frank's talk. And it's something that everyone uh, mentions open source AI, but what does that actually mean? We need a clear definition, just like we have for open source software, so that everyone can work together and have a clear understanding of what actually open source AI means. So it's interesting because the OSI does not define open source software, what we do is we bring different community stakeholders together to come up with a consensus of what's open source software. And we're doing the same, the same step, the same process with open source AI, working with different stakeholders to come up with a consensus. So if you want to be part of that, please check opensource.org. Um, we're, I'm involved with several other projects as well, but Thomas is involved with a whole bunch of projects. So, Thomas, please. Oh, oh yes. Go on. Ah, yes. So, let me uh, detail a bit more about Clearly Defined before introducing Thomas. So, what's Clearly Defined? Um, so, this is our mission statement. We want to crowdsource a global database of licensing metadata for every uh, project, for every software component, component ever published. This is very ambitious, right? And right now, with all the talk around S-bombs and everything related, it's very challenging to actually accomplish that. But Clearly Defined provides a simple way for you to fetch Licensing metadata with a, uh, just a call to an API, and uh, that makes it much easier for organizations. And if there's any missing licensing metadata, or if something is wrong, they can actually contribute back uh, using Clear Define. So we want to create a database that's accurate for the benefit uh, of everyone. So now, Thomas, your projects. <laughs> yeah, I kept it simple. Um, as I said in the other panel discussion, I, I don't really help organizations manage open source or open source Uh I used to run uh, the, the head of open source program office at here and at EPAM, but currently I'm open to work. Um, I do a lot of projects. I build open source to do open source management. So I'm one of the founders of OSF Toolkit. That's a tool to basically automate open source management. Think uh, license compliance or security, we basically try to find a, think of that these were several German companies that were kind of, uh, how I say it politically correctly, seriously unhappy with the current state of commercial tooling, that they basically decided to come together and build their own tooling. Mm -hmm. Then I'm involved in the to-do group, the, the working group on the next foundation to work on how organizations can get better at managing open source. Then uh, if you want to talk as bombs, I'm a maintainer from SPDX, and I also sometimes dabble in CycloneDX. And OpenChain is kind of the ISO standard for basically uh, for trust in the supply chain. Mostly it's, it's how you do, how do you 
you have a supplier, how do you know that they've done their licensing or security decisions properly? So this is where uh, OpenChain can help you. Now, uh, a little bit more about OSIF Toolkit. So as I said, it's a, it's a policy automation orchestration kit. It can do a, a lot of things, so it can generate S-bombs, it can automate your FOSS policy, but the difference is, is it's built by other open source program offices. So this is one of the few tools that's built by the users, for the users, and this stuff is enterprise grade in production. Your car runs, the S-bomb that you get for your car comes out of this stuff. Porsche, Porsche runs this. This was all basically the same because we're all now talking about the, the, the Cyber Resilience Act. Well, the automotives have been dealing, they're exempted from the CRA. Why? Because they already have all these obligations. So they had the same problem. How do we manage open source? How can we make things more sustainable? How do we know what we're using so we can figure out how we can make our stack better? So that's basically um, how the project came about. And the biggest problem that we saw was, and that's where actually I, I left it out, but I'm actually one of the co-founders of Clearly Defined. The problem is, for instance, licensing data. So all the existing tools give you really bad results when it comes to license. I have no enough time to explain all the details, but trust me, most tools that you get, when they say it's licensed, then my first question is, show me the proof, and they often can't. So, it's your part. yeah, should we talk about roadmaps? Roadmap. Yeah. No, you can take it. Talk about roadmaps. All right, sounds good. So, um, here is a... I think you can take that bar, yeah. Hmm? You can take that bar. Yeah, can yeah. I do it? Go ahead. All right, so roadmaps. This is a favorite topic because I said I'm involved in so many communities and I try to get a roadmap together because it's the first question when I talk to uh, corporates that might be interested in bounty. It's like, what are you going to do? When are you going to deliver it? And I'm like, uh, I'm an open source maintainer. I'm not a company. Um, we built something, in our case, when it's ready. When we think it's ready and it works properly, then it goes in. We don't have a, well, we do have commercial support partners in, 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 in our my project, but we build something when we think it's ready and it works properly so that when, in our case, we do license compliance security. If you get something wrong in either of these, you're looking at six zero or seven zeros in damages. So we want to do things as fast as we can. And this always creates a conflict when we can do, we really need this future, we need this now. And they were like, yeah. So we tried at first, we tried to make a roadmap, and because we know, again, a roadmap helps getting new people on board, because if they see the roadmap, oh, you're gonna build this, oh, cool. And, and then also for us, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, we, we, this one needs to go before that one. And, and so yeah, it, it, it helps, but it's really, really, really difficult. And I was thinking about like, why, why, why is that? Well, actually, it's a very unclear market. Because again, I don't have a customer relationship with who's using my stuff. I'm an open source maintainer. Who is using my stuff? Uh, I, I, well, we didn't put any tracking in my software. I don't get your copy of your LinkedIn profile the moment you run my software on your computer. So I actually have no idea what my user, okay, unlike, actually this is nice thing, we do have a nice Slack channel and we do have public emails. When they write me an email or they post a message, then I know, hey, do you use that? And then I actively, as a community manager, go back and say, hey, what are you doing? How are you using our software? And then I learn basically what my users are. Um, but even if I know where they are and I figure out that they need something, it's like, oh, you really should, really, you should really build this together. Then they're like, oof. Um, yeah, we want this feature, but I don't know if we can commit to this. This is a most often things like, yeah, yeah, we really need this. But and I'm like, yeah, well, then I say, give me cash or, or, or give me muscles. Like, give me either cash or give me developers so we can, we can do this. And then it's so like, oh, yeah, where, where, especially if you deal with multiple parties, getting commitment is like really, really, really hard. Because again, even the, peop even the core maintainers like me, I need to control my own time. I, I have a three-year-old. Like, I have a family life besides my open source. So people, generally, all the maintainers have other commitments, personal commitments. How do you balance this? Mm -hmm. And this is where we have the strategy of the commons, right? And who, ha who here has heard of the strategy of the commons? All right. I, I would say half of the audience. So this is an interesting term that's usually used in ecology, right? 
and when understanding uh, like a, a closed system and how uh, the dynamics work. And one example is when you have a pasture, which is the commons that represents uh, the commons, right? Uh, the grass that the cows can eat. And when you have that beautiful pasture, which is available, the cows can eat that. You have the farmers, and everything is okay. But if you have too many cows, then that resource, which is limited, becomes a problem. And this is, this is the same for overfishing, for example. If you have a lake with fishes, and if you have fishers who are uh, exploring, exploiting this common resource, and if they overfish, then suddenly the fishes cannot reproduce as fast as they are taken, and then nobody can fish anymore. So this is something that happens to open source projects, right? It's interesting because software is quite unique. It has zero or almost zero marginal cost. When I have something, a software, and I share that with Thomas, I don't have half software. Both of us have a copy, and the cost to copy software, it's almost zero. It's a, a, the marginal cost is like very low. However, as Thomas mentioned, there's the time, the maintainer's time, and that's the most precious thing. And this is why open source software, free software, it's the commons, and why you can replicate that and share knowledge and share code almost at near zero marginal cost, there is the cost of time for maintainers. So this is something that we have to be careful, the overuse of a common resource, with, with it, which is software, and the time from, from the maintainers. And we also have the free rider problem. Uh, we are all free riders. If you're using the internet, if you're using the World Wide Web, if you're using your cell phone, if you're using cars, you're benefiting from all the knowledge, all the technology that, has, that was created uh, for this. And so we are all free riders. That's important to, to understand. But the free rider pro problem does exist. If you're al always taking resources and never giving back, that, um, that creates a burden on those who are providing it. So there's some interesting stats. 95% um, of the software that's built and available on GitHub is being produced by 5% of the users. A lot of people, uh, so this, um, I think this stats is a bit old. Uh, it's from Nadia, a book I'll, I'll show you later. but. Always uh, a small group of people, of developers, of maintainers, are going to create a large portion of free software and open source software. So we have to understand the free rider problem, right? And if there are many issues around uh, a software, who's going to solve that? If, you're sev if you have several organizations, you might say, hey, I'll just let the other organization solve that. And I'll, why should I spend my time, my engineering, or money to solve that? So this is a problem that can happen. And so as, um, as a project, we have to try to understand and to come up with incentives so that everyone can help and, and promote their, their projects. So this is the book that I mentioned, Nadia. Um, it's a very well-known book, Working in Public, how The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. Uh, she studied GitHub and how, how it works. And here are some commit models of how we can sustain maintainers and also uh, projects. And it can either be through donation, sponsorship, bounties, grants, crowdfunding, it's, a, it's a, a huge list, right? And 
how can we govern open source projects? We could either have a corporation behind these open source projects. We have this idea behind uh, single vendors as well. Or we could have a, a foundation. But even foundations have very different models. So if you're talking about the Linux Foundation and how they work, how they operate, and how they help uh, maintainers and those projects, is very different the philosophy behind the Apache Software Foundation, for example, or the Python Software Foundation. So uh, with all this, we have to understand uh, as an organization, why we should get involved and why we should be part of those projects and help maintain that and help upstream. So <laughs> this, um, this image uh, I saw on other presentations as well, and this really highlights this uh, free rider problem and the strategy of the commons. So somebody here is responsible for these projects, and we have an organization which depends on, this, uh, on these components. If something happens to, to this maintainer, the whole project, the whole software stack can fail. So it's interesting as an organization to help as much as possible and look at your critical uh, components for that software to reduce risk to provide better security, to make the software more maintainable, to help with compliance. Um, you, as an organization, by being part of that, you can shape the roadmap, you can, you can help build features. You can, instead of building features alone, you can work together with other organizations as well, and that will help you reduce costs and reduce uh, resources as well. All right, so now let's look how can contributors commit to a feature in a FOSS project? Because this is actually a, a question that I've been looking at. You have multiple people wanting to build stuff. So a very simple way would be, oh, we just informally agree. We kind of like, oh, I ever built this, this. This is how we actually, most of my projects informally just started. OK, we can build this together. We can do all the stuff. Now, the next step up, oh, we are going to do this a little bit more professional. We're going to be part of a foundation. We get a steering committee. And, and we actually usually, when you're steering committee, there's actually usually money involved. So actually people are being paid to sit on the steering committee and, and decide things. But this actually doesn't always work. So the situation that I actually am very common in, we have new people to the project that have some money or have some developers, but they don't want to be part of the steering committee. They just need to get a particular feature done. But this is a particular feature that's not like a simple pull request. We're looking at something slightly larger. So this is like, hey, what can we do? It's like, well, the standard answer is, OK, we hire a contractor. Yeah, well, yeah, that's not really within our budget. And also, when you hire a contractor um, to do something, um, what if they pull out? Or if we work together on a feature, multiple orgs, what if the maintainers pull out or the, or the other organization that you pull out? These are all questions when people are like, oh, yeah, we want to have this feature, but what happens if, something, if somebody just basically says, like, yeah, I can't con continue anymore? And what if you have different parties that commit to different things? Again, some might have cash, some might, some might have manpower, some, some might have a combination of them. And um, then the question comes about me. I said, I'm a maintainer. So even if organizations want to add feature to my things, I have to review that. So even if they want to build and add things, and this happened a couple of times where big features were being built, and then we were not aware of it, and there were even they're working together, build something, and then all of a sudden it was like, boom, here are new feature maintainers, you have to review it. And they were like, crap. Uh, now, that meant for us uh, lots of long days to review it, but this is really, for me, commonly a way where I will burn out because we get in, oh yeah, add this big feature to support this new update of the standard. That's a lot of review work for us to go through, and we have to see it make, doesn't make sense. Can, because again, once we accept something, I as a maintainer, take on responsibility for maintaining it. So I actually have to understand it, and I have to be able to maintain it. But Thomas, this is free software, right? 
Yeah, okay, yeah. So Vers I, I I'm, mean, I'm supposed it, to work it, for free. It, I forgot. Free. I forgot. Yeah, you, you have to work yeah. for free, Montaigne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm supposed to work for nothing. This is part of free software. So uh, at the end, we go to like, how can we build things together in a, in a way that, that, that does actually work? And then I like, came to the realization, like, hang on, the whole world. Like, I came to this conference, uh, well, n normally you buy a ticket. There, there is like a commitment that I buy a ticket, and then Alexander there will on the back, he will give me access. We have a swap, we have a trade, and that's actually done via a contract. And then I was like, hmm, hang on, aren't open source licenses also contract? Oh, hang on, we, we are already using a lot of contracts. I, I heard a lawyer that said yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. we yeah. had a lawyer, we had a lawyer uh, said yes, open source licenses <laughs> are also contracts. Yeah. But I'm not course, a lawyer, but yeah. Lawyers will say, yeah, yeah, yeah it, 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 it depends, it depends, yeah, okay. Um, and then I was like, hang on, what if we made a contract for like open source commitments? And I'm not saying that this is a standard tool, but basically I, I have a common situation where we have um, multiple parties wanting to work on something they want to contribute, but they're corporates. And, and what is the language for corporate? They understand their co procurement. They understand. So again, it's not a tool that we use for every contribution, but if you have large things that multiple large organizations want to work for them, a contract may be a solution. Uh, and that's how I got an idea from a contributor commitment agreement. Like, we are working now on something that's kind of like a, a, st a standard legal template that we can use to have multiple organizations work together on, on, a, on a feature, a particular workflow, but in a way that basically we as maintainers are still in control. Um, so in that way, we have one standard language text that you can should be able to go to your procurement department and says like, hey, we want to do this feature. So just to give an impression, we have, in my project, we have Bosch, uh, Volkswagen, uh, imagine they want to build a feature to get to, together. If I can make a contract, then you can just like, yeah, yeah uh, maybe Porsche says, like, Porsche has, uh, has uh, um, maybe a lot of engineers, and maybe Nick Peters already said, oh, I have, I have also some money. And Porsche says, like, yeah, we have engineers. What if we can make a contract that they both commit to adding a new big feature? And then we, as maintainers, say, oh, okay, so you already agreed on the funding, and you also agreed when, uh, how much time and effort goes in, and then we look at it like, is it actually feasible? We, as maintainers, can review it. But also, more importantly, if the company's behind it says, like, maybe something changes in this company and they need to pull out, well, that's fine, but we have a contract. So yes, you can walk away, but like any contract, there's small print, there's a penalty clause. And if they say, like, yeah, you can walk away, but it will cost you this way. So in this way, when we know that a, something is agreed on and paid for, we know it's gonna get built. Mm -hmm. We have commitment, we have locked in commitment. And if I have commitment, I can put it on a roadmap. And it said, like, this is for us an agreement. <laughs> I don't want to burn out. If I have an agreement, I, as a maintainer, agree I know where I'm at. I have something for a large features that usually cost me a lot of times. I said, I normally work 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. Nick was very funny because I wrote this presentation from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. when Nick was leaving. Because, again, <laughs> that, that's what we do when we have to get maintainers done. So this is normally how the kind of, again, it's very simplified, but this is normally you kind of your... Your workflow, we have individuals, organizations, they, they basically use GitHub issues. Then we, we now currently try to schedule these things as best as possible when they're small. Then we try to implement them and then we release and the whole thing. But as you can see, us maintainers, we are involved in every freaking step. Because again, we are going to be responsible for it. So then I was like, hang on, how can I take this out? I don't want to be in this contractor agreement. How do you guys do it? So then we came to the idea of marketplaces. What if we could just make things public into a marketplace and we could get all the various sites to basically figure out if there is a match between wishes from various organizations, large organizations, and then if there's a market match, we push them into like, oh, there's a big feature, go to make an agreement between you two parties. So we are not involved here, the market match, they just have to post what they want. Then we have an agreement, and once they have an agreement, hey, then we can easily schedule it, because we know exactly how much there is in there. And then it's much more easier for us to implement, because again, once we get a big feature, we know there is commitment from large parties behind it, and we don't have to deal with it. So that's what we're kind of now working on. We are working on kind of figuring out a way how to make a collaboration 
uh, marketplace specification. It sounds maybe a little bit fancy, but in reality, we're trying to um, build something that is like easy and adoptable. It can be used in other projects. Because remember, I'm involved in a lot of open source projects, and there's a lot of similar problems where I work on problems that generally a lot of organizations that understand open source need, and they generally have money or resources. But they're all like, well, I can only give this. So if I can get them to publish their wish list and say how much they want to do. So this is, this is already a big shift for a lot of organizations to basically publicly say, what are my wishes? And then they maintain their wish list of what they want. And then we'll make a matchmaking bet between them. I think we're almost running out of time, so I'm getting Alan saying to run. Um, so if you want to know more about clearly defined and ORT, we actually have a fringe event. Actually, it starts tomorrow and the day after. It's actually also here um, in, in, in Berlin. Pretty much all of the German automotive OSPOs will, some of them are here, will go to the ours. And that's about it. Any questions? No questions. Yeah, they're in the back. Thank you. It was a really, really interesting topic, and I really enjoyed the, um, the, the presentation. Uh, my question is about um, so you explained about this new concept of collaboration contract that we you call it. Um, what was the name of it? So we have a collaboration marketplace. Yeah, marketplace and the contract. And we have a contributor co uh, commitment agreement. Yeah. Um, is there any use case that you successfully convinced these um, stakeholders to sign this agreement? We, we basically have tested it out. We know it works, mm -hmm. um, but procurement takes a, a lot of time. So uh, <laughs> we have been we able to, we, we now are just formalizing the model that we already are applying. Okay. The fiction is when you get agreements, you need to get lawyers involved, and that's what takes a lot of longer than expected. Don't <laughs> they freak out about this new agreement terms? No, that's the surprise thing. They actually like it because this is actually for their procurement department. This, this is the very standard. That they understand, right? Okay. And okay. maybe speaking about the clearly defined projects, mm -hmm. and last year, uh, Thomas asked me, can you go around each company using clearly defined and ask them for a wish list, right? Mm -hmm. So I went to Ching here from SAP, Lynette from GitHub, who are watching this talk, and I said, can I have a wish list? What do you want for Clear Define for next year? And each one of those companies, we brought them together, mm -hmm. and we're wor working on a roadmap that we're discussing, mm -hmm. and we're going to discuss at ORT community days as well. So the basic idea is to, once you know, for example, that GitHub is investing with engineers, engineering time, uh, or SAP is investing also with engineering and so forth. Once you see that commitment, mm. it creates a virtual cycle. And maybe Deloitte will also want to <laughs> jump in and say, hey, we also want to be part of that. Mm. Once you see everyone committing, that creates that cycle. And that's what we hope to, to achieve, right? Yeah, as I said in my previous panel discussion about not a random view of the wheel, mm -hmm. this is exactly what I try to make. So tons of people that work in open source management, they're reinventing the wheel. They cannot always share what they're working on, but when I worked the last two years of going to all of Germany, the Netherlands, and UK, pretty much 60 to 70% of what the people working in open source management was exactly the same. It may be that some of them are financial services, some of them automotive, some of them are medical, different industry, maybe different internal problems, but the big bulk of problems was all the freaking same. Mm. But they were all spending scarce resources on trying to figure this out. And I was like, can we please stop this? Can we figure out a way that you just, that this is the easiest step for companies. So like open sourcing the code and talking publicly about it, sometimes difficult. But for them to publicly speak like, this is my wish list in a high level, not descriptive things, that's actually relatively easy to get past the lawyers. And once we know what people want, and, they, and again, the problem was not that they, this normally goes into uh, tens of issues, which my as a maintainer, I, I, don't get me wrong, I love people filing issues on my pro project, please continue <laughs> doing that. But large organizations that start using your tool, they have a wish list that is literally, can be meters long. 
And then I'm like, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. What is your top 10? And that forces already that large organization to talk internally, okay, crap, crap, they want us a top 10 list. And they start internally prioritizing. So instead of them liking and storing the issues, I get a more prioritized list of like, what is for this organization, the number one, the number two, the number three? And then I see like, oh, this other organization has the same. Hmm, let me just bring you together. That, that's what I actually have been doing. I said, ORT and stuff, and clearly defined, it was all built because I was just doing this informally. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just saying like, well, I don't like to basically, my job as engineer is, again, engineers should be lazy. I should be able to take myself out of the equation. That's why I'm building this, so I can just give it to other people, like, look, this is how it works. <laughs> Here you have a template, reuse this, and you can probably reuse this for, to get yourself out. Because again, I am a maintainer. I have a thousand and other projects to do. I'm already on my, God knows, 10 project now. I'm working on an OSPO starter kit because I see people reinventing open source management over and over again. So I'm like, stop this. Here you go. Here you have, from about 30 other OSPO leaders, the starting guide, go use it. Again, we as open source community, we need to learn how to build platforms and then build on top of it. This is our greatest open source is, is built by building using an existing project and then built on top. I think that's it. We're running out of time. I can see Paul in the back being <laughs> somewhat impatient. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them afterwards. Thanks.